Hello everyone, this is Professor Vishal Gupta at the USC Marshall School of Business. This video is from BUAD 425 Data Analysis for Decision Making. In the video, I'm going to show you how to use a pivot table to create the confusion matrix for a binary classifier. And I'm going to use the example from class with the loans data set. This is probably the fastest and simplest way to create a confusion matrix, but it has a drawback that I'll show you at the end of the video. In a separate video, I show you an alternate way of creating the confusion matrix using if statements that doesn't have the same drawbacks. All right, let's get started. So you'll see here that I have the Excel spreadsheet that we built in class for the loans data set. If you don't have your copy, you can download one off of Blackboard. And I'd like you to recall that in column A, I have the actual historical performance of every loan, i.e. whether the loan actually defaulted or actually paid, and default are denoted by a one. And in columns I and J, I have what our linear classifier and tree classifier predicted would happen for this loan. So for example, for the loan in row two, we can see that the linear classifier predicted that the loan would pay, the tree classifier predicted that the loan would default, and the loan actually paid. If you're following along with the spreadsheet that you built in class, I will note that in some classes, we used a slightly different version of the revolving balance weight. In particular, in some classes, we use the weight 0 0.0036, whereas in this video, I'm going to use the, this weight, which has five zeros before the three. If you want your numbers to match up to mine, you should change your weight in the revolving balance here. Now we're ready to create our confusion matrix. I'm going to first create a pivot table by going to Data Pivot Table. On Windows, this is going to be under Insert Pivot Table. Excel will ask me where my data lives. It's made a guess. In this case, it's guessed correctly and where to place the pivot table. And I'm gonna choose on a new worksheet. Now I've shown here on the right our confusion matrix in the slides in lecture. And we can see that the actual values of the loans are located along the left. So I'm gonna select the not fully paid column from the pivot table builder and place it into the row labels so that the not fully paid, the actual status of the loan, occurs along the left. Again, I can look back at the slides from class and I see that the predicted value of the loan occurs along the top. So I'm going to go ahead and select our linear prediction column and place it in the column labels. Comparing my pivot table now to the slides I have from class, I see that this almost looks like the confusion matrix we saw earlier except the row labels and the column labels are switched. Just to be a perfectionist, I'm going to switch them so they match. I can do this by selecting the arrow next to row labels and changing to sort descending. And similarly, I can choose the arrow next to column labels and choose sort descending. The only thing left now is to populate the values area of the pivot table. And I can do this by choosing any column from the field name and dropping it into values. I'm going to choose credit policy as an example, and then changing the function from sum to count. On Mac, I can do this by clicking the I here and then choosing count. On Windows, you would click next to here and then choose value field settings and count. And what that does is the pivot table now counts the number of rows of credit policy in each of these four buckets, which is exactly what I would like it to do to create the confusion matrix. To make this a little bit more explicit, I'll copy these four numbers here onto the right and label them the way we did in class. So these are the predicted values, and these are the loans that I predicted would default, and the ones I predicted would pay. Whereas these are the actual values, and these are the loans that I predicted would default, and the ones that would pay. If I wanted to compute the accuracy of this confusion matrix, I can do that by looking at the percentage of loans I, I classified correctly. So again, who did I classify correctly? The ones that I predicted would default and actually default, and the ones that I predicted would pay and actually paid. So I can look at the sum of this two numbers divided by the total number of cases. 
and I can see that my linear classifier has an accuracy of approximately 60%. So that's all there is to creating diffusion matrix pivot tables. In class, we talked about how accuracy probably isn't the right way to think about a good classifier for this particular application. And instead, we might want to think about something like expected profit. And as we did in class, we can compute this by assuming first that we only lend to people that we predict will pay, that we lend them the same amount each time, and that we earn 3% on every loan that we predict will pay and actually pays but lose the full principal on any loan that we predict will pay but actually defaults. If we do that, we can see that the expected profit over this data set would be $417 for this particular classifier. We're losing quite a bit of money. Before ending the video, I wanted to show you the small drawback that I mentioned earlier about using pivot tables to create confusion matrices. As we discussed in class, we often want to look at a classifier and then tune the threshold so that we can maximize the accuracy of the expected profit. The easiest way to do this would be to say change this minus 11 to a different number, say minus 9, and then look back to see what is the new accuracy. Unfortunately, we see that the pivot table hasn't changed from what it was before. It hasn't updated with the new threshold. If I want the pivot table to update so I can see what the new accuracy is, I first have to click in the pivot table, click here in pivot table in the ribbon, and then select refresh for refresh the data. Once I do that, I can see that the pivot table has changed. If we then wanted to compute the new updated accuracy, we could do so by just looking at the new pivot table. So we can see in this particular case that the accuracy has moved from 60% to about 84% by changing the threshold from minus 11 to minus 9. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about what is the new expected profit for this new threshold. Of course, the problem is that selecting here pivot table refresh each time we change the threshold is a little bit manual and a little bit tedious. It might take us a long time to find the right level of the threshold. In a separate video, I'll show you a way to do this in a more automatic way so that you don't have to guess and check to find the optimal threshold. If you'd like to practice your skills, I encourage you to look back here at the original sheet and now form the confusion matrix for the tree predictor, again using pivot tables. There'll be a solution on Blackboard if you want to compare your work. Good luck, and let me know if you have any questions in class.